Hello, so I'm Andrea, um, and um, we are going to walk you through what we've been doing the last couple of years. All right, so for our agenda today, we are going to first tell you what Mrs. Nino's garden is. We're then going to explain what the migrant education program is. And then we're going to tell you about how um, those things collaborated to do a summer school uh, pilot program that was funded by SARE. And we hope to leave um, a good amount of time for questions at the end. So. Okay, so my name is Julia cordova Gurunda, and I'm director for the Mike Regional Service Center. And we are actually located in South Bend Schools. Um, there are three kind of physical centers independence divided into an upper region. I have 22 counties in the northern part of Indiana, and then region two and three split down the state, east and west. Um, and I have been an educator for close to 30 years. I've lost count. <laughs> uh, and I'm Andrea Crawford. Um, professionally, I have been a writer, a journalist, um, an editor, I am also trained in urban agriculture through living in New York City. I went through a program called Farm School at NYC. I've done the USDA Farm Beginnings Program. And um, the farm, the organic farm I apprenticed on was at Snug Harbor in Staten Island in New York. Um, I'm also the co-founder of Mrs. Nino's Garden. And there are three critical people who are not with us today and the garden could not happen without them. So I just want you to see and hear their names. Tim Bayer is um, my neighbor, and he and I are the ones who went to Emily Bastinda Hernandez, who was the executive director at El Computo at the time, with this crazy idea of doing a community uh, school partnership to start a farm. And Dan Newton is another critical partner in this. He's a leader in our neighborhood organization. Um, and so they are not here today, but they are absolutely essential to what we're doing and talking about so what is Mrs. Nino's Garden? We are a partnership between a neighborhood on the west side of South Bend and El Campito Child Development Center. Um, we are located about eight blocks from downtown South Bend in um, this beautiful plot of land. This is the school, 99 years old. It's called St. Stephen's School. It was built to be um, part of a parish of St. Stephen's Catholic Church. The church has been torn down. A grotto still remains behind it. And this large, it's about eight, uh, eight tenths of an acre of land had just been empty. Um, there was some asphalt in the like back third of it, but it was being unused. So um, the neighborhood is um, the, the, the census tract immediately around the garden is one of the uh, poorest in the country. So we rank as uh, the highest percentage of people who are living at or below poverty level. Um, and we have uh, terrible outcomes also on asthma, diabetes, heart disease, low life expectancy. The average household income for our census tract is $15,000 and 42% actually earn less than that. So let's just take a second and let that sink in. Um, in our neighborhood, 75% renter occupied. Um, and we're in a neighborhood on the west side of South Bend um, that had been historically redlined. So line separating what in the 1930s was declared um, hazardous to invest in the yellow section because immigrants and African Americans living there into the red. So declining was yellow, red was hazardous. That line runs right down the middle of this property. So it's also a really glorious neighborhood. So this is more what we're looking like now. Um, we have ring to the, is Brooke here? Brooke is not here. Brooke is here. Uh, shout out to Indiana Native Plant Society. We got a grant to, um, to ring our field with native plants. Um, we're also immediately across the street from the National Studebaker Museum, the History Museum of South Bend, which um, includes on its campus 
the Oliver Mansion. So we're all farmers here. So I suspect we all know the impact of Oliver and the invention of the chilled plow. So the, the man um, who invented the chilled plow, his house is right across the street from this lot. Um, so El Campito, um, when the parish closed and the church was torn down, El Campito was already in the school building. And so the, the parish gave all of this land to El Campito. It is a bilingual, high quality, early childhood education program. Um, and it was founded in 1970 by Mrs. Nino, Concepcion and Ignacio Nino. They were immigrants from Mexico. She had worked in, she had been a farm worker in Texas and had seen children uh, on the sides of fields as their parents worked. And so when she got to South Bend, she wanted to start a childcare program to get those children uh, taken care of and educated. So this is in 1970, the first group of um, kids at El Campito. They continue to focus on, and they have scholarships for uh, children and migrant workers and also um, low-income children. So you, you can actually say that this is like the first migrant ed program in the area for sure. Exactly. So some student demographics um, for El Campito's kids. Um, you can see here, 75% are living in. So they draw from uh, an area larger than our neighborhood, but of the ones they're drawing, 75% are living in zip codes with low accessibility, um, and 86% are racial and ethnic minority students. So when Tim and I, uh, both of whom have training in agriculture, walked into the door at El Campito, and we met Emily Bestin de Hernandez, who was the executive director at the time, and we said, hey, we think we could do things together. It was fall of 2019 and we had big plans for what we were going to do. And then all of a sudden, all those plans went out the window. We were you know, going to do a slow build, have lots of processes, and pandemic hit. As soon as we got clearance from soil testing that that site was gloriously clean, um, in April 2020, we just, put, we just broke ground and put seeds in. We didn't know what was going to happen, but we knew we needed to be outdoors with our neighbors doing something. So we took off in our first year. Um, we That first summer, we spent a lot of time carrying water from the school building to the garden. And so when a Notre Dame civil engineering class came to our neighborhood association meeting and said, what projects do you have that, that we could help you with? We said, we need irrigation in this garden. And so in spring of 21, they tapped into the city line, um, irrigated our garden, and um, also um, we had community development funds to get a fence built. And so we really, in that first year, completely took off. The other thing that was an upside was that kids at El Campito, so they, in addition to the early childhood education, they also do a before and after school program. So the school age kids were learning remotely for their school and spending all day in the school building at El Campito. And so that gave us a great opportunity to work with them hands-on. And so starting in the spring of 2021, they were very at like everything we were growing out there, the kids had started as seeds themselves. Um, they were choosing uh, what varieties we were growing. They were making very colorful options. Um, but that just really took us to a, a great level quickly. And Julia, who was a member of El Campito's board, like very quickly realized that there were things that we could do together. Absolutely. When I think I had gone over to El Campito um, just because I'm part of the board there and I noticed this garden growing. They had started it. I think you guys were still working on the irrigation when I discovered this wonderful person here, Andrea, but at the time it was post COVID and we were just starting to come back. We had done some virtual um, summer school with our migrant uh, families and students. And so we were now coming back and families were reluctant to come back. Some of them were a little bit fearful um, that the virus would continue spreading. And then others, um, the, the kids just didn't want to come back to school. 
And so we need a way in which to motivate them, um, incentivize them to come back to the on-site location, which is typically in one of the South Bend schools. So what is Migrant Ed Program? It is federally funded. It is Title I Part E grant, and it serves migratory children between um, the ages of zero to 21. On site, we have the pre-K all the way up to 11th grade. And then we also serve what are, what are called out of school youth. And these are youth that typically have dropped out of high school. They're, they're the population that's a little bit more difficult to work with. So I wanna show you this because because we didn't run summer program um, during COVID, we had grant dollars and we said, okay, so how can we really think about how to spend these grant dollars? And so we got the clearance to create a mobile STEM classroom um, that we could take throughout the 22 counties. And then we could even take it down into region two and three if needed. So who qualifies? Again, these are children that move. They move either from state to state or from district to district. Families are following the crops. And so they have to have had that prior um, experience in agriculture. Of course, this, these are their guardians or their families. Sometimes the school age students themselves do the work in the fields. Um, here's some of the things that we offer. We offer tutoring summer school, English classes, school supplies, credit recovery classes, a lot of family activities. And then we try to connect them to outside agencies for other types of resources that Title I Part C grant cannot pay for. Um, we also do um, preventative health. So vision, um, dental care, and um, physicals for kids who are wanting to do sports. So what are some of the qualifying activities that our families do? Now, this comes from the entire state. It's not just in Northern Indiana. So they plant, maintain, harvest or pack fruits and vegetables, milk cows, um, water plants and greenhouses. Um, they plant and even harvest sod and they clean livestock stalls. Some of the things that maybe you don't think about when you think of migrant farm workers. And this is what we look like today. Originally, when the, the IDO came to us and said, <clears throat> they came and visited me one day and they said, would you like to run a regional center? And I had just started as director and I said, absolutely. I mean, I saw it as a great opportunity. At the time they had six regional centers and then the funding code, budget code, the way they calculate dollars changed. And so then we became three. And again, that fourth one is technology support. But as you can see, the different breakdown of the, the children who are in our programs. So we work really hard to identify students. When they first came to us and said, we're going to a regional model, it was because they've had two state recruiters. So these are individuals who go throughout the state to look for um, migrant farm working families to see if they're eligible for the program. They had two for the entire state and the Indiana Department of Education sending dollars back to the federal government because they weren't being utilized. So then they went to the regional center model. And so we have two per two recruiters per um, region. And of course we pull in Jesus um, Rodriguez herself um, from Codius. So she, she kind of partners with us too. And our recruiters go out with her and her team from Proteus. So you got to re remember that these schools, these students are moving quite often. So they have a lot of academic disparities and we have to catch them up uh, because they could be doing something in the state of Texas. They moved to Indiana and we could be behind or we could be ahead of them. 
And so there's gaps in their education. And so we try to fill those gaps. So Julia, for many years, has been running that program that included a five-year summer program for her. A five-week. Five-week <laughs> summer program for her teens. And we realized that um, she actually invited us uh, garden coordinators to imagine a way that we could work together so that the program that she was already running could be based in the farm and enhanced by it. And so this is what we wrote um, the grant for SARE that they funded for us. Um, I think, are we all farmers more or less in this room? Right, so we know the power of a farm as classroom. We either grew up with it, we've seen it in action in multiple ways. Um, so, so I'm not gonna, yeah, for art, for science, for leadership, for, um, you know, I once heard a gardener in Chile say that like what you're teaching kids in, the, in a garden is basic democracy, like how do you live with other people? Um, and so that's what's happening. We are entirely volunteer based. So there were teachers at El Campito who would take the kids out into the garden. They would explore on their own. And the neighbors um, also are very active. Like El Campito let us do this on their land and include their kids. And in exchange, they open that up to the community. So this is truly a partnership. So every Saturday, uh, one of us is out there with a group of whoever wants to come from the community. Uh, one night a week, we are out there, open to anyone who wants to get involved. And then during COVID, I was volunteering a lot inside of El Campito. But how do you take all this sort of goodness and formalize it? And that's what Julia invited us to, um, to figure out. And so she, why don't you, yeah, you yes, talk about this okay, one. So. We had to kind of figure out how to get our students to be engaged and to want to participate as a junior camp counselor. But we also knew that they had to be committed. So part of the process was bringing them in to participate either in virtual classes or on-site classes um, with a teacher. And they would do this twice a week virtually. And they were earning points as they were attending these classes. And then they also had to, so, so in order for them to be a junior camp counselor, they had to have so many days in attendance. They had to work on a project and submit a project. And then they also had to do a final exam for them to be a junior camp counselor. So, Students also participated in some intercession activities. So during the breaks, like uh, spring break, um, fall break, we would have some activities planned for them and they had to participate in those as well. And so once they became junior camp, camp counselors, then they had to come to summer school and then participate in the activities with the outcome people kids also. And then at the very end, they were rewarded with a scholarship. And that was that motive. To get them to know. We had another summer time that came to summer school. At the time, we had them in class that first half of the day. And then after lunch, they would go over to El Campito to work with the kids and on the farm. We learned some lessons by doing it that way that we'll talk about here in a minute. So keep in, they are there all day. So that's spring break, that's teacher's breaks, um, fall break and summer. So bringing her program into El Campito allowed us to um, merge those two things. So when her students are at El Campito doing an enrichment for their program, we're also then layering in with the little kids. So here's the spring group. Um, for this session, we hired a teacher from uh, East Chicago, Paxton Suggs, who is here with us, um, a farmer from there. And 
once they'd completed his curriculum, passed the exam she's talking about, they were then ready to be what we were calling counselors that summer. So this is just to give you a sense of what our SAIR grant looked like. These were what our objectives were um, and remain. Um, so generative principles in land use. We want to introduce the use of farms that are healthy, lean, eco ecologically diverse, financially stable, sustainable. Uh, we really wanted to focus, we heard a lot about this yesterday, like we aren't just training farmers, like yes, we do need more farmers and that's part of what we do, but we also use farm-based learning to uh, create leaders and scientists and educators and artists and all kinds of other things. Um, and then this was the really critical part to enliven the children at El Campito so that they're in, to enliven the garden programming so that they're using it more regularly. Um, and Julia's hit on this, it really bears saying again, this incentivized her teens to take part in the federally funded um, programs that they were el eligible for. Um, so we used our grant to get to start up with supplies for a big group of that for adults. We had El Computer has a lot of gardening supplies for children. We needed them for uh, adults. Um, some mentors, which I'll get to in a second. We were showing them uh, some other models, but the majority went to these stipends. Each uh, student upon completion got a $600 stipend. Um, I heard some different models yesterday that I think I like better, but this really worked. This really worked for us. Um, so that first spring break, her students are have been doing their weekly training online, and then they're in place when they're out of school, and the El Campito kids are also there. Um, so this first spring, Julia's students. Julia's program brings resources that El Campito doesn't have. So the kids were able to go and the teens on a field trip to a local park where they have built um, a natural playscape playground. One of the visions that uh, many people, the kids included, have for the, the lot that we have is in addition to crop production, we've got some play spaces for them. Um, so they were actively involved in like seeing what the possibility could be and then planning it. Um, the little, the school age kids were also involved in assessing at this point, they've got a year's experience, what crops they liked last year, uh, what they want to grow again. And we gave them um, seed catalogs because who doesn't love seed catalogs? Like they were choosing what they were growing. Um, I do want to state, if you go back, so here they're designing what they think the garden should be and look like. And then the teens were doing the same thing on the other side. So they were also imagining what this space would look like. And they all created um, their own designs for the space. And that's critical when you go further on because mm -hmm. you'll see what happens. And so then they were back um, for their five week summer camp. So. Julia's kids are in, uh, that's a five day a week, all day program. So they're doing other things. Yes, they are. Um, and again, you know, um, this is one of the lessons we did learn in all of this is that they're out there and we had them out in the afternoon. So they would do their first work in the morning, eat lunch, and then go to El Campito and then be out in the garden. Well, we quickly... <laughs> We quickly learned that it was pretty hot by that time of the day. So we did make some adjustments the next year, but um, we had to really have the hoses out there. We had to have the water bottles out there um, just to get them. So they didn't overheat. And then also taking them in and back and forth between the building and um, the space. So traditionally her structure had been, they're doing credit accrual, language arts, that kind of support in the morning. And then they're visiting colleges um, and other they're extracurriculars yeah, in the afternoon. Field trips and things like that. So um, we added in two afternoons a week where they were camp counselors for the El Campito kids. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do want to add too that we did use some technology because our program has, we have taught the kids how to use drones. Um, with cameras on them. So when they initially came out um, early in the year, I think there was still snow on the ground. 
they also scanned the, the place with those drones and did some activities with those drones. Mm -hmm. And the little ones got to drive some of those mm -hmm. drones too. So in adapting her programming for farm-based learning, we, um, we had the teens visit other farms, so models for what they could be. So Good Shepherd Montessori School Farm in South Bend is a great example of uh, what, a, what a really wonderful farm on a school site looks like. And so the, the teenagers went, um, met with Farmer Terry and got ideas for what they could turn our sort of empty lot into. Um, they went up to Grainer Farm, which is a really fabulous farm in Three Oaks, Michigan, a farm that started as a farm school program and created a very robust commercial, fabulous farm um, outside of that. Clay Bottom Farm in Goshen, Indiana. Ben Hartman has been a mentor to us uh, from day one. He sort of assessed our site for its potential. Um, even though I've spent a lot of time working on farms like that, no one else at El Campito had even really seen what that could be. And so we very early went out to Goshen um, and saw Clay Bottom Farm as like proof of concept because um, it's very it's a similar size. And it's just such a, it's a way to show that like a commercial farm can be happening with a family living on it. And so the access, the way he's designed the farm so that the kids, that his own kids also have access to, you know, fig trees and strawberries um, was a model that we wanted to, to promote for giving to the El Campito kids. And then they also got some guidance from a landscape architect, the president of uh, a local uh, Troyer group, who happened to have been a teacher at El Campito when he was in college. So they were getting professional mentoring from these um, people and seeing some really fabulous models. Um, we wrapped up summer and we came back for fall break. So I should, I should go back to our... So here we have kids. You give kids seed catalogs. And when you have a six-year-old and a seed catalog, what are they gravitating to? So they very quickly discovered rainbow corn. So have you are you all aware of what glass gem corn is? So it was um it's been a great crop for us. <laughs> it is a favorite. We planted it in rows the first year. The second year we built out a, a large uh bed, probably had like 35 mounds um of, of unirrigated like indigenous three sisters formation which the kids loved um they love if you have any pictures of that the three sisters i'd love to see them okay. i'm gonna reach out to you we struggled with our third sisters uh we struggled with our third sister so it's not you know an ideal okay but <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So much. I want to interrupt. No worries. Thank you, Brooke. Yeah, you. Um, I know you're going to miss the native plants I have at the end of the slides. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you do with costume corn? Well, um, you, you nixtamalize it. It's a process that takes a few days. And then you grind it, and then you turn it into tortillas. And so Julia's students came back for their fall break mm -hmm. and worked with the El Campito kids over a series of days that ended up um, with some pretty yummy. I, I think lunch. each kid had the opportunity to grind that corn. It was a little tough, but they got through it. And it was also, it was mm -hmm. special too, because this isn't, uh, it was, it's in their culture, but they aren't still practicing it. So we were all learning it together. And yet, like Diego brought in his grandmother's wooden, practically antique uh, tortilla press. And like, it was, it was really special to see it and to be able to use it. And he was really proud to share it. So that was really like, Probably the best day of the, the year. <laughs> so we've learned a few things. Um, first of all, it's you know, there are a lot of people who can pay to send their kids to really amazing farm camps. Our our kids are not that, and so we're really trying to provide something uh, of quality for them. And stipends for the teenagers are critical. Um, I'm sure that um, the money that was given to those teens um, was not spent frivolously. 
um, most likely, you know, school clothing, school items. Um, and you should have seen their faces when we presented them with the check. Each individual got one. And it was, it was just really kind of heartwarming. They understood the value of putting effort and work into something and then being rewarded. And so stipends are critical. Um, we have to be flexible with our curriculum. Um, so altering so that they're doing classroom work in the afternoon and outdoor work in the morning. Um, when you're dealing with uh, early childhood education that has licensing issues, they, you know, their kids cannot be outside if the temperature hits above 90. Um, and then last year it threw another curveball. So we may have checked the weather and thought, all right, it's morning, we can be outside. And then smoke came in. And so we had unhealthy air quality for uh, vulnerable people, which is basically anyone under 18. Um, so we very quickly had to pivot to indoor activities, you know, like in a matter of hours early in the morning. Um, we've learned that it, it is very exciting to run a garden with volunteers, but you can't depend on volunteers. Um, and we had some, we had some challenges. We had set them up, um, with a notion that we need to be uh, growing for not just humans, inviting nature into the farm. And then we thought, well, maybe groundhogs are a little bit too much nature. So we had a cilantro enterprise that ended sadly because of that. Um, the, the farm, the garden as we created it um, was sort of based on some principles that we have extended into our collaboration with Julia. Um, it's really important for us um, to know where we've come from. You can't talk about food systems without knowing your history. You can't operate on a, you know, what looks like an empty lot in an urban area without knowing why it got to be empty, what was there before, what happened there, why wasn't it cared for. Um, we would not, none of this would be happening if we weren't making friends and building networks. So we like to think like trees, uh, like our Michael Rizial, you know, my, uh, micro and macronutrients in the soil. Like we need each other. We've got to build these networks or none of this happens. Um, and 2020 was a little bit of a lesson because we thought, well, let's do some deep planning. Let's have some focus groups. Let's take this slow. And then suddenly we had to just put seeds in the ground. We still think that process of being inclusive and deliberative um, is, is the way to go. And we really need to build structures so that things like this aren't dependent on enthusiastic volunteers so that what we're building um, outlasts any of our uh, time or enthusiasm. Um, we are very intentional about um, growing crops that are culturally relevant to our kids and our community. So uh, okra is a favorite crop of our community. Um, and it's because, and it's just a gorgeous plant. I mean, we grew a variety that was like taller than I am. And we all think that the okra flowers may be the prettiest flowers we've ever seen. We do a lot of um, peppers. We uh, grow food for predators who will come and eat um, the bugs we don't want on our plants. We've, um, here's some of the rainbow corn. Uh, they were picking out their favorite color, sort of experimenting on what sa seeds to save. Um, El Compito, this is Emily and me, has been able to have their annual taco fundraiser in the garden using some of the, a um, eh, little bit of the produce we've grown, um, but mostly just a great setting for a fundraiser like that. We've discovered things like corn smudge. Does anybody know what this is? Right. So we were like, and it was actually the kids who found it. It's there in the middle. Um, the kids found it like, what is this on our, on our corn? Well, it's a it's a delicacy. Um, and used to Mexican cooking. So, so I've had it in tacos in Mexico. I, we we've we are not harvesting this as early as we should. We've now learned, so we'll try better next summer. Um, but a lot of like members of our community have have um, have asked if they can use that corn because it's organic and not sprayed to wrap their uh, tortillas and um, like tamales. Tamales, that's what I meant. And um, 
have sort of discovered this and are thrilled that it's there. So um, this next year, we, um, we learned some things and I think we got better. And we also uh, have, we were not able to pay them this next year. They all came back and they didn't mind, like they all came back. So that felt great to us. But also, we know it's important to pay them. So um, we're working on that. We developed curriculum so that what they're doing in the classroom with Julia is a little more tied to what they're doing in the field. So we spent um, much of the spring writing a curriculum that is based more in food justice um, and farming practices and like, um, I should say traditions, like using notions like seed saving or how humans have carried seeds with them as we've migrated around the world, using some of that those ideas in the language arts work that they're doing in the classroom. So that's been really exciting for all of us involved. Um, we did an enterprising project. So they had a chef from Beard and Boss uh, come in and say he would buy cilantro for, from them. So we had a meeting with the chef, asked questions, what do we need to do to provide, how much do you need? And then we did a crop plan, um, which was really exciting. And we started our seeds and the teens wanted to like track, like this is the succession that the teens started versus this is the su succession that the children started, like, you know. They were competing with the kids. This was going really, really well until we ran into our groundhog program problem. <laughs> um, and what else should so what other highlights from this year should we? I think that this the student that has the wheelbarrow in the upper right, kind of a quiet student. When we first started the project, even on hot days, he would come to school with a heavy. Um, hoodie on okay and then he'd have the, the hood on and then he'd have his mask on I tried to get him into the into the shade as much as possible but kind of an introvert but you can actually see the progress that he's made because now the hoodie's gone you know he's kind of interacting with the kids still kind of quiet but he has grown so much um during the summer programming and then through the school year He's kind of come out of his shell. And then we also had another student who was really struggling in school, falling behind in credits, was not motivated. And then he was totally immersed mm -hmm. in the project. His name is Julio, okay? And he started showing up on the volunteer days. He started showing up on other days. Mm -hmm. And now he's doing fabulous in school. And now he wants to be a chef. So this whole project just kind of gave him a purpose. And it was just wonderful to see that kind of growth. So they continued the second year in visiting other farms. Pure Green Farms is an enormous um, uh, farm that's launched in South Bend. So they got a look at that kind of growing. Um, we, made, we did some more food projects. Those are really popular, fun for kids and adults, and good to do when the smoke is in the air and you can't be outside. Um, and the teens picked up on what they'd done the year before and seen models of how other farms, school farms, have created uh, outdoor gathering spaces. So they really took an idea they had from Good Shepherd and uh, with some logs that a, a local arborist had dropped for us. Um, built a sitting area themselves for the kids. And that was their favorite thing to do on the lawn. Yes. <laughs> Had some slug races. Um, so yeah, now we've got a few minutes left for questions. Do you have any? Or we can go deeper into anything we've talked about. Uh, you mentioned creating structures to make sure that the project outlives your enthusiastic volunteers. Can you talk more about what you're working on, what you what you're dreaming of in, in that regard? Wow. Um, okay. What we're dreaming of, we're dreaming of a working farm that kids can have access to. So that's why Ben Hartman was valuable to us. Um, that could sustain itself through production. 
um, and sales, which would also have an educator. So we need a full-time farmer and we need probably a half-time educator um, to, to bring that to fruition. Um, and then I can volunteer as much as I want and Tim can volunteer as much as he wants, but it's not dependent on us carrying it. Um, it's been really crucial that Julia has hired Tim and me. So we both have flexible jobs, but we have jobs. Um, and so we, we've been able to carve out like five weeks dedicated to be on the farm with the kids and the teens, sometimes often in the classroom also. Um, and the, and because of that, we've seen the farm sort of grow in leaps and bounds. Um, we have some challenges coming up. We do. We absolutely have some challenges. Um, unfortunately, El Convito has decided to move their location. Um, so the garden and the old structure, um, we're not sure what will happen next, but we have some great ideas as to what could happen. Um, I think the structure, given that it was 99 years old, um, was starting to have some challenges. Uh, the boiler for one, which is very costly. And so they decided to make that move. Um, we anticipate that the hope would be that we still have access to this garden and that that continues, that whole project continues to to flourish and to grow. Julia so is a long time board member of El Compito. I, I have recently joined the board. So uh, we're involved in these conversations. Um, they want Mrs. Nino's garden to stay there and named after their founder. They have moved 10 minutes away and they want their kids back there uh, throughout the summer. So we like we're running, they're moving in March. We're still running camp this summer. I was gonna say, have you guys explored any grants to help with transportation, maybe um, for the kids to maybe maybe bust over or yeah, the director of Alcantito is working on that. Mm -hmm. Um another great thing we from our partnership have vehicles also. So we have two 15 passenger vans that we use. So that can be another means of transporting kids. Mm -hmm. Um and then we have access to school buses from South Bend schools. Okay. So I did have another question real quick too. Um you guys mentioned a fund that comes down from the U.S. Department of Education, and you said it's kind of under they're, they're federal funds, so it's Title I Part C, uh, mm -hmm. title grants, and they give, so the IDOE subgrants us, mm -hmm. so they divide whatever comes from the feds, and they divide it into four region, regional centers oh, based on the number of students, reason. yeah. Okay. So that strictly comes from the IDOE. Okay. I was curious. And but we and IDOE is what the Department of Education. Yes. So there's funds in there where we could provide some resources. We could provide um curriculum curriculum developers um like Andrea and Tim. Um so we have some flexibility with those funds, but we also do have certain limitations too. I have a couple questions. So you said you provided scholarship and stipend? It's a scholarship. Okay. We called it a scholarship. So you, it's the same thing. Yeah, okay. basically. And that's how much? Uh, we were able to provide them six hundred this time. Thank you. you know, and then, child. do you work with the families um, of the children of the youth? And if you do, how do you engage in conversations around their individual rights as migrants? How do we engage? We work with those families all the time. So because we built such. Um, strong networks with them. Uh, they understand that we're there to support and help. Um, you know, at first they're a little reluctant because of trust issues, but because we have bilingual staff that work with them and and actually one of our uh, staff members is, was a former migrant worker himself. And so that really helps a lot. So we have that open communication. I think we're very lucky in that regard um, because the other two regions don't have as many mm -hmm. uh, bilingual staff that I do. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also director for bilingual services department mm -hmm. when, and I have another cadre of bilingual staff and they all help during summer. So I pull them in during summer school mm -hmm. and we just build those relationships. Mm -hmm. And how do you engage with conversations with the families around 
like their individual rights as immigrants in the United States. Um, we have those conversations when they come up. So it's not anything that we directly talk about, except for when we um, work with Proteus and they, you know, meet with all the farm workers. So they do, you know, farm workers' rights and things like that. And we also have guest speakers that come in to talk about different topics. So we try to at least do um, one uh, parent meeting per month in two different locations. And Proteus. Proteus is another program that works with um, farm workers, migrant farm workers. But they, again, they work with adult and some of the kids that are graduating from high school. So our program ends when kids graduate from high school, but we also work with the out of school youth. Most of those uh, students are um, age 2A visa workers mm -hmm. and they come in for very short periods of time. So Indiana is a receiving state. So most of our workers come in during the summertime. Mm -hmm. So we can have really robust summer programs because of that. And what what's Proteus again? Proteus works with um, the yeah, adults. It's actual name. Spell it. What's, Pardon? What does it spell it? Proteus. P R O T E A U S. Is it statewide or is it something? I believe it's statewide, mm -hmm. but they're they are their their regions are a little bit different. So, mm -hmm. but we've got one of the best um, recruiters. Her name is Jesusa. I think it's Rivera. Um, mm -hmm. I think I misspoke earlier. Um, Again, that connection with my recruiter, who, by the way, I've known for many years when I was a teacher, he was a bilingual ed specialist at, at the building I worked with. So then when I be became director, I knew exactly who I wanted to hire. <laughs> and it really helps to have bilingual staff because that's the way we communicate with families. So... Julia is in the Southland Community School Corporation as director of bilingual ed. Yeah. Um, and the, her work as migrant ed, uh, uh, so MIP I, program sort of layers onto that. It yeah. took me a while to understand this. Like yeah, that. I basically have two jobs. <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. So yeah. I don't think I wake up any morning and say, I don't want to go to work. Mm -hmm. And that's why the northern region of migrant ed is housed in Southland schools. Mm -hmm. We also have um, services at Red Gulf, okay, in Geneva. So we have a semi-mobile unit there. And when families come in in August, October, um, that unit is currently housed there. And so then we pull in teachers from the local school corporations to run tutoring programs um, while they're here. So again, trying to um, fill in the gaps from kids moving from place to place. Mm -hmm. So, and then we also had an opportunity just recently to potentially partner with Valparaiso University. So they were working on a grant, a Lilly Foundation grant. And the hope would be that we could provide even more summer programs on the uh, west side of our region. Mm -hmm. Real quick, is Miss Newman's garden, is it its own? Entity or do you do you, you utilize um, the nonprofit to run the programming? It's we are not an official nonprofit yet, so we're right. a project. Are you um, okay? We yeah, um, we are a project that's um, a, a, a collaboration between El Campito and a neighborhood organization. Even our neighborhood organization is a, a nonprofit. Okay. Um, we have, though, um, we have formed, uh, so our neighborhood just went through a planning process, and we are one of four neighborhoods in South Bend that doesn't have a park. And um, what our community, the idea we came up with is that we want a linear park. So we have some really amazing green spaces and cultural institutions. So the History Museum is one of them. Um, Mrs. Nino's Garden is one of them. There is a beautiful park that a private landowner has turned, like four empty lots that they turned into a park that sits directly behind IUSB's Civil Rights Heritage Center. 
which was um, a segregated auditorium that 10 years ago was turned into a center for civil rights. Mm -hmm. That then connects to a historic building that Notre Dame owns and runs their Center for Civic Innovation out of, which connects to the city cemetery, which has this. So we've come up with an idea to link these things. Uh, and to, to advance that, we have formed a 501c3 nonprofit South Bend Conservancy. Oh. Um, so because there are advantages of being an actual nonprofit. And the city's delighted because even the city parks department knows that there's value in having a nonprofit that can partner with you to make these things like this happen. Mm -hmm. So that m may be significant for how the garden gets protected. And I just wanted to add something for you because during our summer programming, it's really critical that we infuse culture into our curriculum through some after-school programming, through the arts, through music, through dance, um, because we want to build the self-esteem of some of these kids mm -hmm. because they've taken feeding mm -hmm. with the you know, environment around them. Mm -hmm. so and that's important for our, that's also important for our community, mm -hmm. which is taking the feeding. Um, yeah. I don't know how much time we have left, um, but I do um, have a question that's like a little bit more like big and visionary. And I did ask this question in another youth uh, uh, focus session yesterday. So I'm sorry if this is repeated, but it's one of my favorites as someone who works in a very similar setting um, with kiddos. Um, but um, children are amazing for their wealth of knowledge and vision. Um, and I feel personally that that's very um, understated and not very taken for granted and also not taken seriously. Um, so have there been any moments working with these kiddos that really stand out in your brain where they share a vision or maybe an action? You already shared a little bit more of like, um, um, some kiddos, but really made you um, reflect um, on the system or on the work that you're doing um, that you really felt like, wow, if anyone else were to see or hear this, like this would really change the way that they go about their life and their work with this wisdom that this little one shared with you today. That's a tough question. But yeah, I, I think we see, I mean, I know that I see glimpses of it um, on a regular basis when we work with families and when we work with kids. And, um, you know, kids that struggled at the beginning who have participated in the process and in the garden and who have just flourished and grown. So... It's really individualized because some of the kids through the garden process may want to be a chef and connected to food, may want to be an entrepreneur and own their own restaurant or business, but also kids that want to look at the arts and how they integrate that into the arts. Um, and so I, I, for me, it's kind of individualized and it comes at different times. And um, I'm a real strong component. I'm a real strong, I strongly believe that children also need to keep their native languages. I also run two dual language immersion programs in South Bend. But even through the migrant program, kids are conversing in both languages and it's okay. Where maybe in the typical school, it may be frowned upon. But we see it as, yes, this is part of who you are, and you're free to use whatever language you want to use. Of course, we're teaching them English along the way, but we don't look down on it. We say, this is an act that we bring. So for me, that's, I do see it. I'm, I'm inspired by them every yes. day. I love working with kids in a garden. 
um, you know, I may have my head down thinking we've got to do this, we've got to do this, we've got to do this. And then the kid like discovers corn smut and a whole new world opens up to me um, or an insect or, you know, you name it. And you just like slow down and are reminded to like take joy in the miracle of this butterfly you just discovered. Um, and, and rainbow corn is probably my best example of that I would have like I had flipped through that catalog rainbow it just didn't stand out to me and then this whole magical world is opened up because one you know little boy was like I like that and so that's opened up so much not just to me but like yeah the whole community um and people around South Bend have like noticed that we're growing this different kind of corn and are coming and finding it um culinary histories have opened up because of it yeah but but all of that just leads to more ideas you know so you hear that or something happens here or something happens there and then you think oh my gosh we could do this we could add this to the project next year so it's always evolving it's never standing still and we're just trying to think okay what is relevant learning what is real and authentic. That's what I wanted for our migrant edge kids. What learning is real. And we know that kids learn by doing the best. They have to experiment. So we let them experiment. And we give them, you know, the platform and the structure um, to be able to do that. So it's just true authentic learning. <clears throat> 